sponsored by Curiosity Stream, now bundled with my streaming video service, Nebula. It feels like every year now, new rumors pop up about Apple switching the Mac from Intel processors to custom, Apple-made processors based on ARM. The same type of processors that currently run in everything from the iPhone to the iPad to the Apple TV. Now, Scuttlebutt has it that Apple's had ARM-based Macs in the labs for years, just like they had Intel Macs in the labs before the big switch to PowerPC. Wow, like 15 years ago already. They've just been holding them like a silicon sword of Damocles over Intel's head to encourage Intel to stick to their roadmap. In an age where Intel has suffered from chronic, almost crippling delays in die shrink and process generation, where they're barely getting to five nanometers years behind schedule and still throwing cores at every problem, Apple is already enjoying the benefits of their own A series on seven nanometer and moving rapidly towards five. And yes, those are all marketing names, but suffice it to say, Apple is shipping silicon on time and to spec, and Intel really, sadly, is not. But on the flip side, many Mac customers have come to enjoy, if not totally depend on the Mac being Intel inside. The software they run is compiled for x86 and 64. They can easily run bootcamp or virtual machines so Windows also works for them on the Mac. And for these people, the idea of Apple moving away from Intel is terrifying. Now, I'm gonna do a series of videos on this where I try to separate the facts from the feels, starting with the silicon and with the Nantech's own Dr. Ian Cutrus. I'm Rene Ritchie, and this is the MacBook Arm, part one. Uh, we get this uh, rumor every year, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's uh, so, as as most of your watchers will know, uh, Apple has been using the Arm architecture in its smartphones and iPads uh, for many years. However, on the PC side, it's all been Intel, and Intel uses an, an architecture called x86. This is basically like a language of how the programs are written and instructions throw, flow through the processor. Uh, and a processor is kind of like a car engine, right? You can either only accept petrol or gas or diesel. So in the okay. same way that when you write software, you either write it for x86 or you write it for ARM. So you either write it for Intel or you write it with uh, you know, the Apple iPhone chips. So you can either write natively, which means you actually you know, build the engine specifically for gas, or yeah. you can use um, an interpretation layer, which is like being able, you converting your engine to run diesel, right? Yeah. It won't run as efficient, but it will run. So what Apple has here is they have the option of obviously using Intel or using their ARM-based cores. Uh, now each each different instruction set has different advantages and disadvantages in, in performance, in power efficiency. Um, Apple obviously likes to stay vertically integrated, so anything they can build under their own steam means that they can optimize the operating system. I mean, iOS is built for ARM, uh, but Mac OS is still built for x86 for the Intel stuff. So they'd have to rebuild it for their ARM chips. They'd also have to have all the software suites rebuilt. Uh, for you know and optimized for that instruction set. Um, one thing I'd like to point out though is uh, you know Apple makes great smartphone silicon, right? These chips are fast and they're often compared to Intel. And you know in uh, benchmarks like Geekbench, you get faster results on the yes. on the ARM chips. Whether that actually equates to a real world performance. <laughs> Uh, is is uh, sometimes debatable. People like to say it though, like, oh, oh, this iPhone or this iPad outperforms a MacBook or a MacBook Pro on Geekbench. Yeah, Apple's current smartphone silicon built on ARM hasn't really seen the prime time yet for high performance computing, which is you know the domain of the notebook for people who are using yes. the Mac Pros to do video editing. So one of the questions here is, would it be suitable for that content creation level performance? And that depends on if Apple and Apple's partners can optimize their software for it. So, I mean, I think it's fair to say that Intel hasn't, they, they've struggled over the last few years. They didn't, they didn't get down to the process node they wanted to as fast as they wanted to. Their TikTok cycle became tick tock, 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 optimize, <laughs> optimize, optimize. I don't want to doomsay Intel, but the original reason Apple switched from PowerPC from the reduced instruction set there to the, to the x86 was the roadmap, it was power efficiency. And Intel offered that to them back in the days of Mac OS Tiger, but that no longer seems to be the case. And I think that's part of what's fueling these rumors. Well, so it, it, Intel, because Intel's been with Apple for so long, 
uh, Apple's software ecosystem has time to be incredibly optimized for Intel, right? Yeah. So if you make that jump in the same way, the power PC to Intel jump in order to make that jump, you have to make sure that your software is optimized off the bat and conform almost as well as if not better than and that is always difficult. So even though we say, you know, Intel may have stagnated over the last few years with its uh, newest uh, chips and product design, um, because they've had this, you know, th they've been embedded in for so long, yeah. that has been to their benefit. Um, and obviously, Apple gets a very good deal on Intel chips. Yes. That's a that's a nice contract to have. I think some people assume that Apple will jump from Intel to AMD. It's like, why isn't the Mac Pro AMD? Why isn't this laptop AMD? And why isn't this other thing Intel? But it, it would seem to me that the contract with Intel is such that the the benefits they get from sticking to Intel from early access to the way that they'll they'll work with them on making the boards to things like integrating PowerNap and all those features, it behooves them to have a single vendor license with Intel. Yeah, I mean, so take Microsoft on the surface, right? We now finally have the first AMD surfaces, but it's only one product, yeah. right? It's they're testing the waters, and AMD is building out the roadmap. Now, sure, the latest silicon looks really nice, and we've tested some of it yeah. on Windows, and it performs really well in a nice design system. But Intel's the incumbent. But you know, Apple's full of smart people, um, and uh, the smartphone chips and the iPad chips, you know, the new A13. It's pretty decent. So uh, if, if they can scale it up from that sort of five, seven watts all the way up to, uh, you know, MacBook Air 15 watt type designs and then maybe even to you know, MacBook Pro 35, 45 watt designs. So there are two ways to do that. Either add more cores, add more graphics. And I guess the third way is, you know, increase frequency, but then you become less efficient. And, you know, that's a whole other ball game when it comes to laptop design. So there's a lot to unpack there. One of the interesting things is um, I think for Apple, just being in control of their own destiny on so many on, on core technologies is an advantage into itself. Like they as far as I know, they have never been late with uh, with an A series chip for an iPhone launch. It just doesn't happen. But they've been significantly delayed on many Mac launches because of the state of Intel Silicon. And not and people say, oh, Intel announced the ninth generation, but the specific chip that Apple needs for the MacBook doesn't come till six, nine, 12 months later. And that seems to be a source of frustration. But for example, when they transitioned from PowerPC to Intel, it was painful because they were so reliant on things like Microsoft porting Office and Adobe porting Photoshop. But the world has changed so much. Like so many people now just use Google Docs on the web and that'll work on the web on ARM and that'll work on the web uh, as well as it did on the web on Intel. And there are so many indie applications if you don't use Photoshop or you don't use Premiere and Apple has its own Final Cut and Logic. You know, it, it feels like a different software world, but there are still people who are utterly dependent on running boot camp or running uh, Parallels or, or VMware virtualization. And I think they're the most nervous because there's no clear Maybe they can run Windows 10X or 1010. I, I'm so confused with what the letter X means now <laughs> that I can't ever tell. But you know that that is that is still a hot mess. I think those people are the most nervous right now about this kind of transition. Well, so uh, Windows on ARM already exists. Qualcomm has their Snapdragon based uh, Windows on ARM, well, Windows on Snapdragon PCs. They like to call them. Um, that yeah. you know they're on their third, fourth generation now. That's still having a slow rollout because companies haven't optimized their software for ARM. So um, you know, so software translation is is a thing that has a lot of issues <laughs> involved with it, and uh, Qualcomm and Microsoft are working on that. Now with Apple having it all in house, obviously you know Apple can manage it perhaps a little bit more streamlined, though. The question still remains. I mean, one argument is that uh, Apple has been migrating its software its and using partners like Adobe to migrate its software to yeah. ARM for use with uh, smartphones and iPads yes. for years. So they already have a leg up there. Now, the question is, will, this, will the new chips be of a similar design to the smartphone chips? If so, then, yeah, it, you know, it could be just a very easy port into an ARM-based MacBook. If not, you know, there may be other optimizations that can be had for performance. I mean, rendering a video, right? You you can tell the difference yes. between a 30 minute render and a one hour render, right? Yes. Now, you can that that could just be the difference in software optimizations for a, for an Intel based chip. Now, can you do the same thing on an ARM based chip? And can Apple add more features to 
because they have a bigger power budget, can they add more features to the core to help accelerate that, like uh, vector instructions and such? So what's super interesting to me is that Apple, like they've, they have had MacBooks running ARM for a decade, the same way they had MacBooks running Intel for a long time before they made the, before they announced the transition. And they've had Mac OS ported over uh, for, I forget how long, seven, eight years now. And they've been building out these interesting things like metal, which sort of abstracts away part of the silicon. So they can take something, a task that comes in and they can say, this is going to the CPU, this is going to the GPU. Oh, the, you know, the, neither of those do uh, H.265 well. So we're going to send that to the T2 chip because it's got dedicated uh, decode and code blocks just for H.265. And they're sort of doing that um, dispatch system. And they're doing things like bit code, which let them go to the, from the Apple Watch from 32-bit to 64-bit without developers even knowing or doing anything about it. And I wonder how many sort of those mechanisms they have in place combined with the webification of so much software will make this an easier, not a, not a painless transition, but an easier transition. Uh, I mean, for the raw software, it's still a translation versus native issue. Uh, you know, translation when done right can have very little overhead. And like as you say, you know, transition from 32-bit to 64-bit, you know, developers didn't notice because everything just kind of worked without that much of a performance penalty that it was actually affecting how people were using that. Uh, but because because a laptop is such a more versatile machine, yeah, you know, even from iPads, right? iPad Pro was has been advertised as a professional working device that companies can use, but you still use it slightly differently to how you use a laptop. Yes. Uh, and there, there, there will be advantages and disadvantages in that. Um, is, is there a way that you can see ARM scaling? So for example, an iPad, the kind of ARM chips they put in iPads now, that sort of makes sense to transpose to a, a new mythical 12 inch MacBook device. But as they want to scale to a MacBook Pro style device or to a Mac, I mean, maybe like an, uh, an Apple TV is like a Mac mini style device, but they want to scale to an iMac device, never mind things like the Mac Pro yet. Is there anything in terms of monolithic versus chiplet designs or doing massively multi scalar cores, like going to 15, 20 core? Is there a clear path to how ARM gets big across Apple's product line? Um, so in the server world, all the ARM chips we've seen so far have been monolithic. Uh, these are going, you know, 32, 64, 80 core designs. And at the minute, they're all monolithic. They're all kind of built on 16 nanometer or, you know, some are pushing seven nanometer for the upcoming hardware. The, the reason why to go chiplet is because manufacturing gets more complex the smaller you go. So it benefits to have the smaller design. Also, certain things don't scale. Uh, the reason why AMD when chiplet is because some of their I.O., some of their USB and PCIe stuff uh, didn't scale as well, and they felt it was more financially beneficial to enable chiplets in that design. Um, so at the minute, Apple has some good success with 7 nanometer, and it looks like they should have some good success with 5 nanometer. Um, so as long as 5 nanometer can help build those slightly bigger, you know, 200 square millimeter designs, um, then bigger chips shouldn't be that much of an issue, assuming they can also get the frequency higher. The what, what One of the interesting questions is going to be similar to how in smartphones today, you know, Apple's designs have two, three, four cores, but all the Android smartphones have six or eight cores, right? In the laptop space, uh, the Intel chips are, you know, four, six, eight cores. The AMD yeah. chips are eight cores. What will What would Apple do in that situation? And again, does the software that is natively compiled for ARM and those devices, will it scale you know, beyond two, three, four cores? Will a video render uh, be able to use those cores or will it offload to the GPU? And can Apple make yeah. a bigger GPU that actually makes sense? Um, G GPU design is really interesting because you can get a really nice design that works in you know, two, three watts that when you scale it up to 15 watts just isn't efficient anymore. <laughs> it, 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 it's more than just adding repeating units. You have to make things wider and you have to make you know, the memory accesses um, lower latency or higher bandwidth. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting semiconductor issue. Um, Apple's traditionally some of the people that can do that, um, though we'll have to wait and see. With, with Apple, you would assume that they would hit it at the right point. Now, is it the right point this year? Uh, we all thought it was yes. the right point last year or the year before, <laughs> right? Um, 
uh, uh, Apple takes their time on, time on this, and it, it's shown over rec- over uh, previous product generations. Yeah, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. No worries. Thanks for having me. For more conversations like this, check out my brand new podcast. You can find it every week in your favorite podcast player. Or even better, you can get early access to the full-on video versions on Nebula. Nebula is a streaming video platform I'm building alongside other independent creators like TechAlter, Ali Abdal, Jill Borup, Jordan Harrod, Tirzu, and many, many more. And we're building it for things precisely like these podcast episodes, which I love making, but which the YouTube algorithm would just utterly destroy and likely hurt my entire channel at the same time. On Nebula though, we're free to experiment to do stuff exactly like this. And now, because Nebula comes bundled with CuriosityStream, you also get access to its thousands of documentaries and series by people like David Attenborough and Chris Hatfield, which, wait for it, is right now offering an absolutely incredible deal. 40% off annual subscriptions and gift cards. And that makes it, yeah, just $11.99 for the whole year, 12 months, seriously. So that you can stay curious, stay entertained, and stay engaged while we're all here staying at home. Go to curiositystream.com slash Renee Ritchie for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series. And now, Nebula as well. Enter the promo code Renee Ritchie to start your membership completely free for the first 31 days. Thanks, Curiosity Stream, and thanks to all of you for supporting the show. So I think conventional wisdom has it that we'll see Apple start small with a new 12-inch MacBook or a MacBook Air variant on ARM, maybe even a new Mac Mini, and use those to both test the waters and reduce anxiety levels for pros. But there's a chance Apple could be much more aggressive here as well. At least that's what I think, but now I wanna hear from you. Hit like, hit subscribe if you haven't already, ring that bell gizmo so YouTube will actually tell you when new episodes go live, then hit up the comments and let me know. How do you want to see Apple transition its Mac lineup from Intel to ARM? Or do you even want them to? Thanks for watching, and you can see what Apple's been up to with their ARM chips in this video right here. And I'll see you in the next one.